in. I'm going to get a crick in my neck this morning. I know. <laughs> they've, they've spread everybody back out again. And uh, we're just doing that as a precaution. You know, it's, uh, I'm sure you're aware, and we are too here at the church, the elders, that, that this uh, pandemic is not quite over yet. And uh, it's trying to reinvent itself and make variations. So we're going to watch it closely. We're going to try to be safe and we'll monitor everything. Hopefully someday soon we'll be able to get all the chairs back together again. Well, we're in second, excuse me, first Thessalonians, second chapter. You got your Bible, you want to turn. I'm going to start at verse 5 this morning. I want to say something just extemporaneous before I get into this. It pertains to the verse 5, but uh, blessing, blessing. Uh, the word blessing, it's a Christian word. It's a scriptural word. Beverly and I play a little game uh, quite often during the week. We'll be watching TV or listening to the radio or be around some people. And uh, they'll let that word come out. They'll say it's a blessing. We'll be at a restaurant and uh, the waitress uh, that's taking care of us uh, will use that word. And we'll look at each other and we'll go, there's one of ours. Because Christians use that word. It's not a word that lost people use. They don't have a concept of blessing like Christians have been taught from the scripture. And think about it. What is it? You know, if it's, uh, it's sometimes it could be words. People can bless another person with their words. Often do. Uh, it's also something else that we think back upon the unmerited or just the flat out goodness of God to give us things that we've got. I got out of my wife. And she's a blessing that God has given to me. And uh, I've got three kids. And, and those are blessings to me. My life, he's provided for me to be able to put food on the table for our family. Uh, the weather. We give God thanks for the blessing of the summer that we have had in 2021. Uh, the reason I'm saying all this is I want to contrast it with something that's in verse 5. And you're going to see what I'm talking about shortly. And let's do it. He says, well, this is Paul now, remember. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. And God is our witness. I mean, he's putting it right out there to Thessalonian Christians saying, wait a minute. You think back about the time I spent there as a missionary, starting the church. And you'll understand when you remember that we never used words of flattery. Now, I want to get real specific with you this morning. I, I've got another Bible study that I did a year ago that I've never had a chance to teach on flattery in the Bible. And it might surprise you. Do a word study sometime and see how flattery is depicted. Some people have got a good eye, a good uh, uh, what's that? Feeling about flattery. They think that it's okay. And I want to tell you, it's not. Flattery is not blessing, if you will. Uh, flattery, we often think about somebody coming up with complimentary words. But flattery is complimentary words intended to tickle the ears of the hearer in order to to gain a favorable impression, to gain influence over that person for their selfish needs. They want something. Oh, you're such, such a wonderful, wonderful person. And I just love you and can't wait to be around you. And if it's a flattery person, what they're doing is trying to make inroads to gain control over you for something they want from you. As opposed, and hear me, as opposed to blessing, when we walk up to one another and we bless with sincere words and love and appreciation and walk away with no expectation of receiving anything more, that's a blessing that has been given. It's not flattery. Flattery is something in the Bible that uh, the person doing it always wants something. 
They've got an ulterior motive, if you will. They're a manipulator in the Bible. They don't uh, come in honesty uh, and compassion. They come wanting something from that person. There was a uh, court preacher in France in the 17th century for King Louis the 14th. His name was Francois Fenelon, and I liked something he did one day. Back then, they had church every day at the, at the castle. The king would come and all his uh, attendants, and they would have church every day. It was a religious time, don't you know? Well, one day, King Louis came walking into the castle chapel, and he looked around, and there was nobody there. Just the preacher and him. And he he looked up at Fred Coyce and he says, What does this mean? Where is everybody? And Fred Coyce said, Your Your Highness, I let it be known today that you were not coming to church today. In order that you, Your Majesty, might see who serves God in truth. And who flatters the king? Yes. Flattery is something Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians that he could never, ever do. He was there to start a church, to lead them to Christ, and to teach them the foundation of Christian faith. But he never did it for any ulterior motive. He had no hooks that when he uh, had to leave, that he would have expectations from them. That's flattery. Paul did not flatter people. Verse 6, he says, Never did we seek glory from people, I like that, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now, I know you have a, a biblical understanding of the apostles, the 12 apostles, those uh, ones that were chosen by Christ to be with him in his earthly ministry. Of course, one of them we know was Judas, and he fell. Uh, he was replaced uh, miraculously by Jesus himself when he chose Paul to be the 12th apostle. Those guys had authority, is what I want to say to you. They were, they were the founders of the church, right? It would have been like 12 Billy Grahams walking in the room when they were present together. They had great authority. They were the ones that the Holy Spirit used to write the scriptures, the New Testament, right? Right. They wrote the scriptures. These are guys you could sit down with them and talk, and they could tell you about the day that the Holy Spirit came on them. And they wrote the Gospel of Mark, or the book of 1 Timothy, or the book of Revelation. You can sit with them. These men had authority. What Paul's saying, look, I was an apostle when I came to you, and I never used that as some sort of a tool to make you bend to my will and do what I said. All I came there for was to share the gospel. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Greenway this morning, what he was saying uh, toward the end, when he was talking about the fact that it's the gospel that God has, has, has uh, given to us that, believe it or not, simply sharing those words with people can lead to people's lives being changed. Amen. Right? I mean, in the world, you can go to counseling and therapy for 30 years and never get to the bottom of a problem. You can go to school as a student for 30 years and you might get an education and you might not. But the gospel, the simple proclamation that Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he ascended to heaven, that gospel shared with a boy or a girl or a man or a woman can miraculously change their life. And it does every day all over this world. Amen. It's changed your life. Who were you before you were saved? 
What were you like? And Paul is saying, we didn't come there seeking glory from you, from you or anybody else, he says. Though we could have, we could have now, we could have made demands as an apostle, but we didn't. You know, this uh, little phrase he uses, it's important. It's a, it's a phrase that uh, is important to me, and I can't remember how and where and when God so oppressed me with this, uh, but it is, a, it is a constant thought in my head to never, ever attempt to seek the glory that belongs to God. Yes. myself. That's very important. It's important for all of us. Every Christian needs always to be the one that is quick to point and say that God be the glory. Great things he has done. Jesus, John 5, 44, listen to him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and, that you, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Two things. If you're coming to church seeking glory from Christian people for who you are, for what you do, for what you have done, you're making a great mistake. Yes. Don't be a glory seeker. Your happiness lies elsewhere. The applause of man does not satisfy men and women. They think it does, it does and not. As Jesus said, you're not seeking the glory of God. Having God approved of you is what you're really looking for. It's what you're seeking. God's approval, God's faith upon you. Don't look for it from human beings. Seek God and allow him to bless you. Daniel 4. You remember Daniel 4, that story about King Nebuchadnezzar? You remember him? Interesting character in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4. We've got a, a story where that king was out on the balcony looking out over Babylon, a great, marvelous city, the Hanging Gardens. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. He built it. But here he is on a balcony and he gets it in his head that he's somebody special. And watch this. The king reflected and said, <clears throat> is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? I'm getting nervous. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty has been removed from you. Amen. God took it. Yeah. And he turned into an animal. And for seven years he roamed around in the woods, eating grass and leaves. And his nails grew long and his hair grew long. Until one day, he gave God the glory, and God took away his mental illness and yes. restored the kingdom to him. The principle is don't, don't take God's glory as being something that belongs to you. Don't do it. King David wrote Psalms 115, verse 1. It's my favorite verse in all the Psalms. It was the motto of the Templar Knights during the Crusades. In 1119 AD, they were formed to go to Jerusalem and protect the pilgrims that were arriving by ship as they journeyed down the highway to Jerusalem. And their job was to protect them from bandits and Muslims. They had a very strong sense of Psalms 115.1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, 
But unto thy name give glory because of your righteousness and your truth. You, do you see the theme that goes through these verses and through the scripture? We are here to bring glory to God. Why, why are you here? Why have you been born? Why have you been given the years that you've been given? How many more years have you got? The answer to all of those questions is, as long as you are accomplishing giving glory to God, you have a purpose in, that world, in this world. I firmly believe that the trouble our church in America is in resides in this. Too many churches have got hippie looking preachers and musicians that are performing like a rock band with lights and smoke and they are not giving God the glory. They're performing for an audience. Yeah. Friday, I received an email of a new national survey that's just been completed and it ruined my Friday. I tanked out. I lost it. I got so upset. Uh, poor Beverly was with me. Uh, we went out to eat that night and I made a fool of myself. I'm so angry. But they have just completed a major survey of evangelical Christians living in the United States of America. Evangelical, you know what that is, right? That's us. That's the so-called Bible-believing, blood-bought, Jesus is Lord Christians, evangelicals. National survey, over 50% of them surveyed said they no longer believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven. Now friends, that upsets me. I mean, what are they being taught? What sermons are they hearing? What kind of church is that that would have Christians that don't believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life of you? Verse 7, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Uh, here's a man uh, using a simile to tell his people that he was like a a woman in the, to try to act like a nursing mother to these new Christians in Thessalonica, right? Right. They were baby Christians. And so I, he says, I didn't use flattery. I didn't seek your glory. I, I treated you like a nursing mother. I had authority, but I didn't treat you that way. You know, Preacher talked about college football this morning. I, I concur with everything he said. <laughs> and and uh, you know those guys that play college football now? I, I, I follow Oklahoma University. Every member of their offensive and defensive line are over 300 pounds. Isn't that amazing? And that's not unusual. Here's my point. Have you ever noticed when they stick a microphone in the face of a 300 pound football player what he says nine times out of 10? You know what he says? Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> he never says hi, dad. He says hi, mom. And I understand, I mean, that hurts me, but, but, but I understand. I understand it's a woman that carries that baby inside the body and delivers him or her and nurses them and raises them up and is there to put band-aids on their knees and a kiss on their forehead. It's usually not that. Paul was like that nursing mother with those people there. He loved those new Christians and gave himself to them. Verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, listen, but also our own selves, our own lives, because you have become so dear to us. 
three weeks. Three weeks he was with them. And that's the kind of man that Paul was. He was so filled up with the love of God and so captured by the beauty of the gospel that in three weeks' time, these people that he had led to Christ were like his children. They were like his family. That word affectionately desires there, that's all one word in Greek, and it's the only place in the New Testament it appears. And it indicates the yearning love of a mother for her child. And I appreciate that. Let, that. let that come in. You know, I know dads have a part in the birth of a child. But they don't have the part that the mother has. They don't carry that child for nine months. And they don't go through the pain of childbirth. And it moves me to no end when I see what Paul is saying here, that he is affectionately desirous of these new Christian people, just like a mother with her newborn baby. How she would hobble and care and listen and watch and do for that child whatever it needed. That's what Paul's doing. Isn't that something? He's an apostle, an author of the Bible. And he's loving these people. He said that uh, we were ready to share for you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. So there. His personal life was on the line for them. And I'm not just kidding. Paul, after three weeks' time, run out of the city. That, there was a screaming mob yes. trying to capture him, to kill him. He left under threat of death in a hurry. Yes. Now he talks here about the fact that he was willing to offer himself for them, right? That's pretty clear there in that verse 8. Uh, let me give you a couple other verses Paul wrote. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, And I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. I, if I love you the more, am I to be loved the less? In other words, he was willing to die for these churches. Here's another one. But even if I be poured out as a drink offering, offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you. You know what he's talking about there? He's facing execution. He's going to be having his life poured out as an offering to God for the sake of these new Christian people. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, Apostle Paul. Fourteen ninety four, William Tyndall was born in England. He was a man that God used to translate the Bible for the first time into English. Right? Uh, at the time, England was Roman Catholic, and it was anti-people uh, reading the Bible. They didn't want people to read the Bible, and William said they should. And so he translated the Bible into English. <coughs> and when he did, the king issued an order that he be captured and put to death. They caught him, and then they came to him in prison, and they said, Mr. Tyndall, the king has ordered that every single copy of your English Bible be found and burned. It's not going to be here in England. William said to them, in burning my New Testament, they didn't do anything that I have not been looking for, nor will they do anything more to me, even if they burn me like they did my Bibles. If it be God's will, it will be so. Amen. Now how's that for courage? How's that for commitment to the gospel? And to the church. Well, he was strangled to death. Then they tied him to a stake and they burned him. And when they strangled him, the 
the last words he said was, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And you know what? One year later, that king reversed his order and ordered the translation of the English Bible, which became your King James Bible. Lord, open the eyes of the king. That's what, that's what Paul is talking about to the Thessalonians here. <clears throat> he said, remember, brothers, <clears throat> excuse me, our labor and our toil, because we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So what he's saying here is something that's very clear, very easy to understand. When Paul was with them, he did not take up offerings at that church for his support, although he could have. What he did was, he worked as a tent maker. And he got up early in the morning. It says night and day, he was working maybe before sunrise. And then he'd go out and preach through the day, and then at night he'd get his tools and go back to work and make some more tents that night to earn enough money for his food and his key. So he's reminding the Thessalonian Christians here that, that uh, I wasn't there to get something from you. I was not there for ulterior motives. Rather, I worked night and day uh, to support myself so that I would have the freedom to go out and preach the gospel in your town, which he did. Acts 18.3, Paul came to Corinth, another town, to join Aquila and Priscilla. And because he was of the same trade, they were tent makers, he stayed with them and they were working for by trade, they were tent makers. Paul sometimes would make tents. But sometimes he would allow the churches to take up an offering. He taught that it was uh, right for ministers to be supported by the offerings and tithes of the people. But at times, when things came up, which apparently what's going on here in Thessalonica is that, is that somebody there, somebody that probably ran in out of town, said all he was doing was coming here trying to get rich off of people's offerings, which is far from the truth. And he's correcting that here in verse 9. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee. He was raised and taught in Tarsus uh, to study the law, and he studied under one of the most famous rabbis in history, Gamaliel. And Gamaliel said one time, his teacher, he said to all his rabbi students, he said, if you don't teach your son a trade, you're teaching him to be a thief. Yes. Well, that's, you know, that, that echoes with me. That echoes with me. I think it does with every dad here. That, you know, when you're raising your, your son or your daughter, you want them to be able to be productive adults that can provide for themselves. And if you don't, and you teach them to be bums, that's what they're going to become. That's all Paul's doing. I didn't come there to take offerings from you. I came and I made tents in order that I could preach the gospel to you. Verse 10, you are witnesses and God is too. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Paul is asking these people to just calm down that whoever's there stirring up the list of offenses that Paul took, just calm down and remember what me and Silvanus and Timothy were like when we were there. Do any of these, th these charges ring true? I think I put in your hand out a list of the charges made against Paul in this passage. It's extensive. Quite a few things. Now these are probably the same people who ran him out of town. Shortly before this letter was written. 
But all his, his case is resting on this, is this. You were there. You were there when I and my two missionary friends started your church. And you know that none of these things are true. And then, he says, with power, God is my witness. He stands before God. I swear that none of these things are true. For you know how, like a father with his children, verse 11, verse 12, he the sword in each one of you, and encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You remember a while ago, that verse that said he was like a nursing mother, right? Now look at this. Now he's like a father. He's using another simile to describe the role that he had for these new Christians. Both of them just a matter of a few verses. So like you've got the nursing mother, uh, you can picture that, that's tenderness, care, uh, provision for a little one. Uh, we all understand that. And then typically with the father, don't want to go to great extremes, but typically with the father, you, you think of discipline and a little bit more stern and uh, maybe a teacher raising this child up uh, to be a productive person. Uh, so in other words, what Paul's saying is, look, when you were a baby Christian, I loved you like a mother, and I, I gave you the milk of the word, I, I got you on your feet, and as a father, spiritually speaking, I'm there to guide and direct and be a, be a little bit stern from time to time. That's okay. But that's what fathers do. They discipline and help the child to grow. 1 Corinthians 4.14, I don't write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, Yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. So what he's saying there is something a little different. That was 1 Corinthians 4.14. What he's saying there is, because I'm the one that shared the gospel with you and then asked you to bow your head and pray and ask Jesus into your heart, I became your spiritual father. That's what he's saying. He uses that image when he talks about Timothy often. Timothy is somebody that he led to Christ. And what, what we've got here with these Thessalonian Christians is, uh, is two things. He says, I was like a mother to you when you needed me to be so. Uh, a baby Christian, I'm also, as your spiritual father, the one that shared the gospel with you. I did that too. And so I've got a right to treat you way I do. Amen. Now verse 12 he said, he's talking about when he was there, right? He was there three weeks. He's saying I exhorted each one of you and I encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Walking one step after another step. That's what walking is. And that is what he uses as an analogy of the Christian life. That yes, he shared the gospel, led them to Christ, but now, as a baby Christian, it's up to them to take one step after the other. One day at a time, after the next day, the next day, the next day. And what he's saying is, in doing so, they're going to be able to walk worthy of the kingdom, the kingdom that God's got prepared for. Amen. You know, I think it was Ray Bowles that had that song. Uh, I used to like it until I heard about Ray Bowles. But uh, he talked about being in heaven and meeting somebody that had become a Christian because he had gave some money to a missionary to go overseas. You remember that song? 
Thank you for giving to the Lord. Yeah. That's what Paul is talking about here. That when the kingdom comes, and he goes to be in there and live, when heaven comes, when Christ comes, that he's going to be in the presence of people that he influenced to become Christians. What a, what a, what a glory that will be. I'm going to have to hurry here. I'll, I'll do my best. One more verse. We thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Prayer. Paul prayed. Paul prayed constantly, he said, thanking God for the day he was in Thessalonica and he preached the gospel and these people received Christ. Right? He was there. He was, he was in church that day and saw people walk the aisle and get saved. That's what he's talking about. But the most important thing, hear this, the most important thing of all is that when he gave the word of God to those people there, they received it as what it was, the word of God. Amen. Not the word of men. It's not another book. This is the word of God. And friends, our, our world needs to hear this. Those evangelical Christians I've talked about that don't believe Jesus is the way, they need to hear this. This is the word of God that we teach and preach. The word of God. Inspired, delivered to us without error, authoritative, inerrant. It's everything that we need to live a godly life. And we've got it. The word of God. When I went to seminary, I didn't know it was a liberal seminary. And when I got there, they had an orientation for freshmen. And I went, and they said, uh, this guy got up and talked. And he said, we welcome all you new uh, young preacher boys. And he said, we're going to teach you that the Bible is not the Word of God. It contains the Word of God. And we're going to teach you how to find what part of it is the Word of God. And I went home to Beverly and I told them I made a bad mistake. Yeah. But we, we stayed and they didn't get in that. The Bible is the Word of God. All of it. Amen. Every word. Amen. And what Paul is thankful for here is that these people have understood that when they accepted the gospel and they were born again, that God was the word. And that yes, he's given us his word, the Bible, the scriptures uh, for our God. The Bible's true. But friends, we better stop at this point. I know some of you, uh, I think they're going to be having a conference in here in a little bit, so we probably need to go. I appreciate you Attention. Next week we pick up at uh, verse 14 and we'll finish chapter 2. We may be going a little bit further. We'll see. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning to bless your name. We bless you, Father, for the grace, uh, the gift of being in a church that believes the Word of God, that brings uh, conservative teachers and preachers to us. We thank you, Father, for every Bible study teacher that we've got. We ask for your blessing on the Lord. Pray for all our deacons and our elders. Father, that you preserve them in the truth, all the truth. We ask, Father, that uh, you teach us each day this week how we can glorify you by walking worthy of you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.